Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Thank you. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this live fully active webinar brought to you by the Monroe County uh, Bar Center for Education. My name is Jill Paperno and I am the president of the Monroe County Bar Association. Today is May 4th, 2021, and this is Liberalism and the Rule of Law, hosted by the Monroe County Bar Association. We'd like to thank Canandaigua National Bank and Trust Wealth Management, The Daily Record, and Woods Oviatt Gilman LLP for underwriting this program. For CLE credit, in order to comply with the accreditation regulations, please fill out your affirmation form and evaluation sheet at the end of the program and email it back to Danielle Matias. In exchange, you will receive your certificate of attendance after the program via email. Please note that all attorneys must attend programs in their entirety to receive credit. According to New York State Continuing Legal Education Board, CLE providers are prohibited from issuing partial credit. Please note that everyone's line has been muted for the presentation portion of the se session. If you have a question for the panelist during the program, please submit it using the Q and A feature. You may also send the question to fellow audience members or to the host for technical difficulties using the chat option. So again, I'd like to welcome you to the first of our Law Day programs. Um, this week, a lecture by Professor James Gardner on liberalism and the rule of law. Last year, the Lawyers Coalition for Racial and Social Justice was seeking to present a program on voter suppression. During the pandemic, we had reached out for speakers and I communicated with a professor at, in California who asked me, why are you asking me? You have one of the foremost experts on election law in your own backyard. And I'm just gonna lower my phone there, that's coming across. Um, and so that's how we were fortunate enough to have Professor Gardner speak to us in September. His discussion foreshadowed some of the issues that led to January 6th. Indeed, during his presentation, he seemed to anticipate some of what came to pass. Professor Gardner is one of the most highly cited legal scholars working in the election law field, recently ranked among the top 10 most cited faculty in election law scholarship, according to the influential election law blog. He is also a top, a top national authority on American state constitutional law, as well as the principles of federalism upon which it is built. Professor Gardner is the Bridget and Thomas Black SUNY Distinguished Professor at the University of Buffalo Law School. He has published several books from his first in 1993, Legal Argument, The Structure and Language of Effective Advocacy, to Election Law in the American Political System in 2012. He's also a prolific writer, often writing for journals on the structure of governments, constitutional systems, and federalism. We are so grateful that he is here today with us. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome Professor James Gardner. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you for that very kind um, introduction. So um, I've got, um, as you might expect, a PowerPoint. Uh, so I'm gonna share it and then we can take off. Okay, are we doing all right then with that? So we, it does look like we're gonna have to switch the display settings. Now. Okay. Thank you. How's that? Perfect, thank you very much. Okay, very good. Uh, so um, the subject today is the rule of law. Uh, this is the subject um, that the ABA uh, decreed um, uh, to be the topic for uh, this year's law day. Um, you can see their um, their theme, their statement of the theme up there. So um, let me tell you what I'm going to talk. So my subject is the rule of law, but I want to approach it from from a maybe a, a slightly different angle. Uh, so for, I'll start off with just a little basic definitional stuff. Um, I, I think lawyers are familiar with what the rule of law is, although maybe it's not at the tip of your tongue if you were asked to define it. Um, but what I want to focus on um, uh, a little more is this very long struggle to achieve the rule of law. The rule of law is not something that dropped into our laps. The rule of law is an achievement that had to be fought for, um, as it, uh, for over a long period of time uh, in a struggle that was difficult and bitter and even bloody. Um, and, and that's a big part of the message that I want to share with you today. Um, that struggle formed our inheritance. And so I'll go into a little bit about how the rule of law is shot through the American legal and constitutional orders. 
Um, and then I'll talk about some recent challenges to the rule of law. And, and those, uh, of course, are ones associated with the Trump administration, which is no doubt why the ABA uh, decided that the rule of law would be our theme this year. And then I'll, I'll finish by talking a little bit about the bar and its particular role in upholding the rule of law. And none of that, I think, is going to be um, mysterious to you. So let's talk about uh, what the rule of law is. Uh, so some, some basics. Um, the rule of law means essentially that everyone is subject to the law, including the people who exercise authority over us and even the highest um, of the highest among them. The rule of law historically has been often defined in opposition to another kind of rule, and that's the rule of men or the rule of persons. Um, a, a principle that tends to be associated with absolute monarchy. So in this kind of a system, uh, the whim of the monarch um, uh, furnishes, um, sorry, furnishes the, um, uh, the principles of law and, and those principles don't apply to the monarch because the monarch is the source of them and makes them up. Um, the, this notion uh, of, of what's opposed to the rule of law is also captured in the phrase that's sometimes used, rule by law. So uh, rule by law thinks about law in this way. The supreme authority imposes law on others, but is not um, him or herself uh, bound by it. And this is a principle that's associated really with, with dictators. My, my favorite expression of this comes from Oscar Benavides, who was the military dictator of Peru in the 1930s. And he um, uh, at le famously, at least among comparative constitutionalists, is reported to have remarked, for my friends, everything, for my enemies, the law. For my friends, everything, for my enemies, the law. So the, the law is something um, that uh, the supreme authority imposes on others, but is not bound by them. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the struggle to achieve the rule of law. And I want to talk about it in two different dimensions. One is ideological. Um, and that's where this notion of liberalism is going to come into uh, the conversation. So by liberalism, I do not mean... Um, partisan, the kind of partisan liberalism that we think of in our political system with a left to right um, uh, scale of partisanship. I'm talking about liberalism in the philosophical sense, and I'll explain more about that. So there is an ideological aspect to the achievement of the rule of law in terms of furnishing justifications for it. And then there is an actual physical, bitter, bloody struggle against royal absolutism from which the rule of law emerged. Okay, um, so let me start with liberalism. And before I can talk about liberalism, I want to talk about the, the ideological environment that preceded it and against which liberalism reacted. So in pre-modern times, so this is ancient times up to, up to the medieval times, let's say, um, uh, a philosophy of, of naturalism is really what governed thinking about the public sphere. And um, the, the, the philosophy of naturalism essentially holds that whatever is, whatever we see, whatever we look around and see how the world is, that's how things must be. There is no alternative. And not only um, is the way things are the way they must be, the way they are is good. Um, and this is predominantly because uh, of the underlying belief that there is a natural order to the world, and that order is, to a large extent, divinely prescribed. Um, but this notion of naturalism does not just apply to the natural physical world. It also was applied to um, human societies. So there's an idea that human society, however human soci societies are, that's the way they have to be. There's no alternative and it is good. This way of thinking was often associated um, in this period with a metaphor. And the metaphor was the metaphor of the body politic. What you're looking at here is a, a, a image that was uh, famous in the 17th century. It's a, it's a sort of image of the, of the monarch uh, towering above his realm. But if you, if you squint up close, uh, what you can see is that the body of the monarch is actually made up of lots of tiny little people, the people of his realm. So, so in, in some ways, this is a, this is a nice idea. Uh, the monarch is not, 
doesn't sit apart from the people of the realm. Uh, the, 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 the realm is constituted by its own people. But um, the metaphor of the body politic took things um, a, a lot further than that. And, and, and what it held is that essentially nature dictates social roles. So the analogy worked like this. Um, the, the, the metaphor is to a biological organism. So we know that a, an organism has different parts that are differentiated and have different functions and they work together to create an entire whole healthy organism. So uh, a human organism has a brain that's sort of in charge of things. It has arms uh, and limbs to get things going. Um, it has a digestive system to provide for its nutrition. Uh, it has feet to move the thing around. And each of these different parts of the body has a very specific role that it has to perform faithfully. And um, these body parts can't change their roles. If they do try to change their roles, the health of the organism will be um, irrevocably damaged. You know, if the feet start trying to uh, uh, feed us, um, we won't be healthy. And the same metaphor was then applied to um, the political and social system. So, just as their society has, uh, just as the body has a brain, society has a ruler who runs things. Um, it has a particular class of people who who get things done, who defend the state, who uh, uh, win glory. Um, it has a part that, that feeds us and nourishes us. And then it has feet uh, to keep the whole thing up and that would be the peasantry. And the according to this metaphor then, it, social roles um, are, are given, they are dictated, they can't be deviated from because if people try and deviate from their um, prescribed social roles, the roles into which they're born, the entire organism could then fail. So uh, according to this philosophy, everyone had to do his own part within his assigned role for the good of all. And in this system, uh, the, so the pre-modern political system, uh, God designates a king, so the king rules by divine right, and then the king rules uh, his subjects. And ordinary people have no say in the system; they have no agency. They are they are literally subjects. They're the they're the objects upon which um, uh, uh, the divinely appointed king um, exercises authority. So liberalism <coughs> was designed to justify a reaction against this very strict. Um, naturalistic philosophy of social and political relations. And so what liberalism did was it, it provided a, an intellectually coherent set of justifications <clears throat> and it set out a narrative. And this narrative is actually uh, very familiar to us. It's really second nature for Americans, I think. Um, it is one that's associated primarily um, in the Anglo-American tradition with John Locke, uh, who wrote um, a really important book, uh, The Second Treaties of Government in 1690, sort of laying this out. Um, and it's also echoed in the Declaration of Independence, really our foundational document in the portion of the, of the document talking about, in which Jefferson talks about self-evident truth. So, so this narrative is taken to be self-evidently true. Um, that's the degree of acceptance it had. It doesn't require defense, it's, it's self-evident, everybody knows it. So, so what's the liberal narrative? The liberal narrative begins with the state of nature. Um, so we don't begin with human society. We begin with people outside of society, isolated, sort of running around in this natural state. And it doesn't matter for this philosophy whether such a state ever existed. It's a, it's a way of describing a, a belief about how human beings naturally are. And um, so the state of nature is kind of a, of a bad uh, and dangerous place because there's no organized society and there's no lawgiver and there are no rules. And actually Hobbes called life in the state of nature nasty, brutish, and short. So um, in order to improve their situation, people in the state of nature form what is often called a civil society. So this is an agreement. It's really the, the social contract. Uh, it's an agreement to form a society, to give up some of the freedom that everyone enjoys in the state of nature for the benefits of security and order. And then once a civil society is formed, the members of the society rule themselves through the principle of popular sovereignty. And what does that mean? That means they can choose 
the particular form of government that they may that they may want. They can choose a democracy, they could choose a, a, a monarchy, um, whatever they prefer, but it's up to them. And that's the point. And this is a, so they confer authority on their own rulers. And this is authority that they can revoke. This justification became very important during the struggle against royal absolutism, as we will see. So um, liberalism is, is really a, represented a huge change in, in, um, in thinking about, about the role of human beings in the world. Uh, under pre-modern ways of thinking, the world simply acts upon human beings. They have no agency in how the world is. They just have to accept it. But liberalism says, no, it actually flips it. Uh, humans operate upon their own world and they can do so based on uh, reason. So um, the consequences and principles then of liberalism to sort of sum up would be uh, a decisive rejection of naturalism, um, uh, the notion of choice and popular sovereignty based on reason rather than on divine authority or on the whim of a monarch. And again, uh, humans become actual agents in constructing their own world. And so the basic tenets of liberalism in it's really uh, the starting point is fundamental equality of citizens. We're all equal in the state of nature. Um, so no one has privileges, no one has an exalted rank, everyone's the same. And popular sovereignty, as I've said, the people rule themselves. And here finally we get to it, okay. The rule of law, that's a principle of liberalism, a core element of liberalism. And the rule of law, I think, is how the people rule themselves. It's because of the rule of law that the people are ruled, are not ruled by the arbitrary whim of some leader who they didn't choose. Uh, so the, we'll see how the rule of law um, uh, makes the connection between popular sovereignty. And, well, it, it is the essence of popular sovereignty in a way. And, and finally, just to round out the picture, liberalism often conceives of some basic package of human dignitary rights that goes along with essentially with being a human being. Okay, so there's the ideological angle. And what I wanna talk about now is this really long struggle, centuries in the, in the making against royal absolutism, mean, by which I mean the unmediated, unconstrained rule of men as opposed to rule of law. So um, I'm gonna cover a, a little bit of European and, and particularly English history here. Um, if this story is unfamiliar to you, you might find it interesting. Uh, so the 16th and 17th centuries in most of Europe were a period of consolidation and centralization of power in the hands of absolute monarchs. So this is what Europe looked like in 1500 or thereabouts. And you can see it was really a collection of lots of little different independent principalities and small monarchies. Um, and what happened was uh, more or less at the, around the same time, the monarchs in France and Spain and Italy and Germany conceived plans to expand their territory through consolidation. So they would pick up some of these smaller um, independent things one by one and expand their own territory and power. Um, and that could occur uh, by marriage, as it often did. Um, it could occur by mutual agreement. It could occur by um, uh, alliance. And it could occur by outright conquest, which is, again, often how it did occur. But to make that kind of consolidation possible, power at the center of the state, royal power, had to be increased and centralized. Um, and that meant other power centers had to be subdued. Externally, of course, it meant that other monarchs had to be subdued. But even internally, it meant that other traditional inherited sources of power had to be subdued. That would include, for example, members of the nobility and quite uh, significantly the Catholic Church. And at the same time, allegiance had to be relocated from these other different minor power centers to the major power center of the crown. So this was a project of state building. And, and the great um, exemplar of state building that other monarchs around Europe admired was Louis XIV, who um, it first inherited and then completed really uh, one of the most successful consolidations of power in European history. So um, 
So here's uh, some images of, of France in uh, you know, 12th and 13th century. And you can see it's basically a, uh, you know, a collection of independent um, uh, principalities. Um, but by 1500, uh, there, a lot of consolidation had already occurred. Now it's basically three or four different kingdoms. And um, when uh, Louis XIV uh, took uh, the throne in 1643, he really completed the consolidation so that by 1700, and he, when he was still in power, he ruled until 1715, France had close to its current modern day boundaries. So what did Louis do? Um, he had all kinds of strategies. He subdued the local nobility. He tied them. He tied their prosperity to the prosperity of his own court. He reduced papal influence in his territory. He centralized revenue collection. He centralized military authority, taking it away from the barons out in the hinterlands. And um, so, uh, Looking across the channel from England, 17th century um, English royals saw this and they wanted some of that. Um, but unlike in France, they ran into some very stiff resistance and the stiff resistance did not come from the expected sources, from the nobility or from the church, which had already been subdued in England. It came from uh, Parliament. And so, the consolidation of power, the, the royal plan to consolidate power in England um, pitted two different institutions of the same government against one another. One, the king uh, appointed by God, the other parliament appointed by the people, or at least not as, not as broad a slice of the people as, as, as today, but still uh, it, was, it was representative, far more representative than the crown. And um, what happened during this, this uh, conflict was that Parliament struggled against the crown to establish its authority, its authority as essentially as a lawgiver. So uh, originally Parliament's function was quite narrow. It, it was a, a, an assembly that existed mainly to grant royal requests for revenue. So uh, uh, English kings did not have the power to raise taxes. This was not uncommon during that era around Europe. Um, they needed the consent of some body and, and, and parliament was, was the body. Um, but uh, so English kings, as I said, wanted what uh, was happening in France for themselves. Uh, so they wanted to engage in state building and they needed to centralize power to do so successfully. And that required money, but if you need money, you need parliament to say yes to new taxes. And so that frustrated these 17th century kings. I'm talking here about Charles I, Charles II, and James I, James II. Um, and so what they did was they tried to go around parliament uh, by raising sources of revenue that were not traditional and therefore not controlled by parliament or to bully and intimidate it. Uh, so uh, Charles I refused to summon parliament for 11 years or so, but uh, neither of these strategies worked. And um, instead, what happened was a direct struggle ensued between these two bodies. So I'll just hit some highlights here. Um, in, uh, in 1642, the king actually sends troops into parliament to arrest the opposition leaders. Uh, that was unsccessful. In the summer of 1640, Parliament actually fielded its own army, and this led to the English Civil War. Uh, and this is really uh, quite remarkable. Uh, um, uh, so two branches of the, of the English government are actually engaged. So this is not like territorial. It's not like the North versus the South. Uh, um, this is, the, this is uh, Congress versus the president is essentially the modern, um, the modern equivalent. After a long uh, and drawn out uh, uh, fight, uh, Parliament's army, uh, commanded here by Oliver Cromwell, defeated the royal army, um, assuring essentially parliamentary ascendancy. Um, uh, but uh, as uh, is typical in a typical pattern, I guess, things went further. The army conducted a, a coup, it purged Parliament of opponents. Um, it uh, executed the king, and eventually uh, Parliament decided, uh, or the army decided that Parliament was, was untrustworthy and dissolved it too. Um, 
and uh, established a protectorate under the sort of dictatorship of, of Cromwell. So this is a vivid illustration as an aside of the risks of military rule. You invite the army in to do something and first they're a liberator and then they become a tyrant. Anyway, conditions um, uh, eroded in the country under the protectorate to the point where with, with great popular support and relief, uh, the crown was restored and Charles II became king. And um, when he died, he was succeeded by James II, his nephew, who, who did not appear to have gotten the message about parliamentary power and authority, and so sort of revived the centralizing absolutist agenda of Charles I, leading to further conflicts with parliament and eventually to the Glorious Revolution in 1688. And, and the Glorious Revolution, um, essentially was, was a, a sort of quick operation. Uh, James II was very unpopular. A group of dissenters wrote to William of Orange, who was uh, a nobleman uh, of, you know, in, in uh, Holland and Netherlands, um, and invited him to invade England and take over the crown, which uh, he agreed to do and met up with little resistance showing that this was a fairly popular move. And James was allowed to uh, flee to France. However, William's, uh, William took the throne under a set of conditions. So this was part of the deal. The throne was essentially offered to him, um, but on conditions. And um, those conditions included to govern according to the laws of parliament, to accept the English Bill of Rights, uh, which parliament passed in 1689 and is actually the source of many uh, rights that appear in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and so there was a set of new rules. Um, the monarch now quite formally, and not as a result of, of uh, uh, grudging um, acquiescence, but formally governs in accordance with the rule of law. Those laws are established by parliament. They're established according to customary procedures that are well known uh, and which bind that body. And so, um, uh, the consequences of the Glorious Revolution and the events that went before it were par Parliament is now established as an institution, uh, a checking institution, uh, providing checks against the crown. Uh, the repudiation of the divine right of kings now is formalized and complete. Popular sovereignty is institutionalized and the rule of law finally is extracted in blood essentially from the English monarchy along with a package of civil rights. And that I think really was the American inheritance. So that's kind of our starting point, this very long struggle. So let me turn now to the ways in which it seems to me that the rule of law is woven into our legal order. And uh, I think it starts with some very basic understandings of our legal system. So for example, uh, it is a basic understanding of our legal system that laws are binding only if they are made by authorized bodies according to authorized procedures. That is an aspect of the rule of law. That's what makes it the rule of law rather than the rule of people who issue laws. And, these laws are published so that everybody knows what they are. And even maybe more important, they are considered to be permanent until they're changed by the same, the very same processes that created them. So it's a very narrow set of authorized processes for lawmaking. And anything that's going to count as law has to come through that pathway. It can't issue from the will or whim of somebody in power. And only those laws, only laws made by this process can be applied by the government to its citizens. So there's a, 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 it's what it, the philosopher H.L.A. Hart called the rule of recognition. We know, we know how to recognize what laws are and how to distinguish them from other requests or, or even threats um, because of their provenance. The rule of law also, it seems to me, is baked into our legal practice. Just the everyday way that we go about doing law in the United States um, is a consequence of the rule of law and shores it up. 
So for something I think as basic as regular, ordinary legal analysis. So when you think about legal analysis, you know, what is it? Well, we learned in the first year of law school, legal analysis is the invocation of a rule and then the application of that legal rule to a set of facts. That is the rule of law. That's the way law operates. Law operates as a rule that is invoked and then applied to um, a factual situation. Another aspect of the rule of law that's baked into our legal practice is stare decisis. So this is the idea that we need to treat like cases alike. So what's the idea? The idea is that a rule of law, which remains constant, will produce identical outcomes in identical situations and similar outcomes in similar situations. The, the law is not one thing in one set of facts and another thing for a different set of facts. And, and stare decisis is, is often said to be the essence of justice. So it, it, what is just, just is to give the same treatment to people who are similarly situated. So in a sense, um, the rule of law is really at the core of our conception of justice on an everyday basis. And then into our regular, baked into our regular legal practice are, are all sorts of ethical rules of impartiality. So decision makers, judges, and so forth have to decide without fear or favor is the traditional expression. So not afraid of the consequences, not hoping for um, uh, favorable treatment by reaching one kind of ruling rather than another. Lawyers, of course, are beholden to zealous representation of all their clients. So uh, you don't uh, give one client a worse chance to achieve justice than another. Conflicts of interest, of course, are prohibited of decision makers and also of lawyers. So again, impartiality is a way of, um, of uh, elevating the law over other considerations um, to the central consideration of what kind of legal results people get. I think the, the rule of law is also um, woven deeply into our constitutional system. Um, one place you find it, I think, is in the idea of constitutionalism itself. So constitutionalism is the idea that the constitution is the highest law and any other kind of law has to conform to it. Um, this is, um, has been adopted overtly as, a, as, as an aspect of our constitutional system since Marbury versus Madison, um, where uh, the court established the principle of judicial review and then was echoed much later in US versus Nixon, uh, where the Supreme Court said, the president is not above the law. Uh, even the president has to comply with a subpoena issued in a criminal case by criminal defendants seeking exculpatory evidence. And then uh, even most recently in Trump versus Vance, so the Supreme Court uh, uh, sort of uh, affirmed the result of, of Nick, the Nixon case, holding that uh, the president does not have absolute immunity against an investigatory subpoena directed towards his private business arrangements. And then um, uh, the, the rule of law is, is, is uh, sort of inherent in the idea of constitutionalism, in the idea that the constitution can only be changed by its own authors, who are the people, who are the ultimate sovereign uh, in the system. I would say the rule of law in our system is also institutionalized in the various ways in which power in our constitutional order is dispersed. So we have a horizontal separation of powers, that's separation of the government into three branches. We have federalism, which is a vertical separation of powers in which power is divided between the national and state governments. And what does this dispersion of power do? Well, uh, uh, Madison tells us um, that the dispersion of power is necessary for one thing, and that is to prevent the accumulation in the same set of hands of an amount of power that would be sufficient to free a government actor from the need to comply with the law. So in this way, um, by dispersing power, no one can assume the functional position of an absolute monarch and therefore begin to dictate terms to everyone else. Law remains the only source of binding authority. And of course, uh, judicial review is an important aspect of the rule of law in our system. And that's, so what's the idea there? The idea is that you have an impartial body, not one that's engaged in politics, at least at the 
the federal level, not so much at the state level. Um, so it's insulated from politics. And this is the body that's going to decide whether other actors have complied with the Constitution. Um, those actors are not going to decide for themselves, at least not um, have the final say about whether their actions comply with the law or not. So again, um, uh, it's designed to um, make sure that the law is superior to the wishes of individual actors within the system. I would also add to these formal aspects of the Constitution a whole set of what people are talking about right now as informal norms. So uh, the four years of the Trump administration uh, brought to our attention something that really had um, fallen out of view, which is that uh, the constitutional system does not consist solely of uh, an array of formalized, explicit legal rules or even implicit legal rules that are that are binding because they're inferred from the commands of the document. There's also a set of much broader unwritten informal norms um, that support the rule of law. And um, so let me start actually with with norms that are even broader than 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 constitutional. So these are norms of democracy itself. And here I'm following uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt, they're a fantastic book called How Democracies Die. Um, if you want to be depressed, uh, go ahead and get a copy of that book. Uh, it's terrific uh, uh, read, but depressing. So uh, um, they argue that uh, democracy, the, the survival of democracy depends upon its members adhering to two really global uh, informal norms. One is mutual toleration which they describe here, as you see, it's, it's the idea that, that we accept that our opponents, our rivals have a, have a right to exist and to compete for power. And if they win democratic elections to govern, we don't deny that. And then um, there's what they call institutional forbearance. So this is, and this is really interesting in the context that we're talking about, which is the rule of law. So here are the ideas to avoid actions that are consistent with the letter of law, of the law, but violate its spirit. So the idea here is that the rule of law is not a rule merely of technical literal commands. It is um, a set of commands that are embedded in a much larger and broader and humane set of assumptions. So uh, these are informal norms, as I say, that I think support the rule of law in the American legal order. Um, but um, I don't want to stop there. I want to, uh, to talk about some other informal norms of the U.S. constitutional system that I think are quite closely tied up with maintaining the rule of law. So here's one. Uh, the president doesn't personally supervise criminal investigations and the Justice Department operates with some autonomy. Now, as a technical constitutional matter, there really is no bar to the president making um, quite uh, down in the weeds decisions about who gets investigated, where these investigations go, when they're terminated. But over the centuries, an informal norm grew up in our system that that's not a good way to run a justice system. And so um, a, a norm evolved that the president gives the attorney general a great deal of distance and latitude um, to make decisions about criminal investigations. Another that um, uh, arose more recently, I think, is that the president complies voluntarily with disclosure and conflict of interest statutes that don't apply to him. Um, so uh, the, the federal um, ethics legislation that applies to members of Congress about disclosure and conflicts uh, exempts the president and the vice president. And yet, uh, until um, the Trump presidency, presidents have voluntarily complied with this. So again, this is supportive of the rule of law, right? Conflict of interest is, um, um, uh, uh, an important, um, uh, um, important subversion of the rule of law. Another informal norm, uh, so the president doesn't deride the independent press and whip up public opinion against it. And that, in a way, I think also supports the rule of law. An independent press has been said many times by the court and by observers uh, to play a, a really important role in holding um, government officials accountable, accountable to the law. And so um, an attack on the press is uh, to some degree an attack on the rule of law. 
Another informal norm is that the president doesn't threaten the leader of the political opposition with jail and private violence. Um, obviously, that's uh, related to the rule of law, which controls this political succession in our country. Um, the president doesn't publicly attack and deride members of his own administration, thereby um, undermining public confidence in the administration of the law. The president doesn't publicly attack the federal bureaucracy and undermine its legitimacy since it is the federal bureaucracy that administers the law in an impartial way. The president shouldn't deride the judiciary um, and uh, uh, mount public opinion against an independent judicial branch. That's a direct attack on the rule of law. Um, okay, insult and belittle foreign leaders. Uh, um, the president, there's an informal norm, I think, in our system that the president makes a good faith effort to make well-considered decisions based on facts and shows respect for facts and knowledge. This is really quite similar, I think, to, to our notion of what uh, legal analysis is. You take a rule and you apply it to the facts, but you need to use the best facts that you have. And then finally, it hardly needs saying, uh, there's a norm against the president inciting violent insurrection against the lawful government and attempting to interrupt the constitutionally prescribed um, processes for presidential succession. So um, recent challenges to the rule of law have certainly come from the Trump administration. I guess I've sort of indirectly mentioned a few of them, but let me sort of pull things together. So um, undermining judicial independence by attacking judges who ruled against him, um, that is an attack on the rule of law. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Trump's over disdain for the law and constitutional limits. Um, and in fact, even for the very idea that the president might be limited by the constitution um, was a challenge to the rule of law. Uh, he actually said at one point, uh, when you are president, the power is total. Um, that shows a profound lack of understanding of what law is. I would include here the normalization of cheating and lying uh, on his taxes uh, in every aspect of his life, um, and of course concluding with his denial of the legitimacy of a properly run election. I would add um, his abuse of the pardoning power, so uh, this is a way of undoing the rule of law, uh, uh, using the pardon power for on behalf of cronies, and it reminds me of very much of that um, quotation I showed you earlier from Benavides of Peru, for my friends, everything, for my enemies, the law. Um, along these lines, uh, President Trump reversed military convictions of soldiers convicted of war crimes over the objection of everybody involved. Uh, so uh, that's certainly undermining the rule of law and attacking federal bureaucrats just for doing their jobs. Um, so federal bureaucrats are supposed to do their jobs impartially. They're supposed to administer the law impartially, um, attempting to intimidate and threaten them um, is uh, a way of threatening that impartiality in the administration of the law. All right, so let me wrap up in a couple of minutes uh, with the role of the bar in upholding the rule of law. So I really think that Everything that we do as lawyers on a daily basis uh, is intimately involved in upholding the rule of law. So I, I would include representing clients, helping them figure out their legal rights and interests, and advancing those interests through either advocacy in, a, in, a, uh, um, in an adversary proceeding or, or through uh, transactions that the law permits them to take to make themselves better off. So how do these things um, um, advance the rule of law? Well, uh, in the following ways, I guess. Uh, so these things that lawyers do help to ensure that the law has meaning in the real world by invoking the law in real situations and then applying it to those situations. So the law is not something sitting in a museum unused. It's actually out there getting used every day for the benefit of the people that it's supposed to benefit. And this that's the 45 how, signal. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> thanks. I, I got I got one more minute here. Um, uh, lawyers and the things they do every day help clarify the meaning of the law by invoking it um, in particular applications. So again, the law is not 
uh, uh, something um, idealized. It's not something that is mysterious. Uh, we actually know what it means because we're using it every day. And uh, to the extent that um, the state is involved in legal activities of lawyers, um, then what the bar does is to help keep the state, the government, uh, within the bounds of its authority by invoking judicial review of official action to test it against the law, to make sure that what's ruling us is the law and not the people um, who have the power to inflict it on us. And then finally, I think as officers of the court, so here lawyers play uh, you know, an interesting and tricky and dual role, but um, I, I would describe what lawyers do as officers of the court as helping to achieve the proper balance in society between liberty and order, which is a really tall, tall order to, to carry out. But, but I think that's ultimately uh, what we are charged with doing. And that is it. So there you go. Happy to take uh, your questions, thoughts, comments. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't see any questions right now, but I guess let me ask you this question in light of the lecture you gave in September and, and essentially your prognosis at that time. In discussing the rule of law and, and some of the norms and that have been broken um, in recent months or over time now, um, how do you feel that we can, if you, do you feel we can restore those norms and um, begin adhering to the rule of law again to the extent that we've departed from it? Uh, you know, I, I, my sense is, so I, I wish I had a, a crystal ball that would forecast that. <laughs> let, me, let me deny that immediately. I, I guess my sense is that significant, significant damage has been done to the system and to, the, and to its foundations. Um, and it will take, I think, a long time uh, to get back to where we were, if we ever are able to get back to where we were. Um, I, you know, I, I, in a way, um, recent events have done us all a favor of showing that we are divided society in ways that we did not necessarily realize. And that's a useful thing to know. And, and, and you know, I, I think it's a, a valuable, really important piece of information for people in authority to, to take cognizance of. But uh, there's going to have to be, an, you know, years and years and years of, of contrary role modeling to um, erase the, the, the image that, that many people have come away with of what it means to be a leader in, um, in our country. Thank you. There is a question uh, in the Q&A, and the question is, what about the use of executive orders? So I guess I'd ask you to address, you know, where does that fit within this construct of the rule of law? Sure. Well, uh, you know, um, executive orders are um, legal instruments. Uh, 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 so uh, I, I started my career as a, um, a trial lawyer for the U.S. Department of Justice in, in Washington. So, so I, I actually had some encounters with these things. Um, an executive order, the, the, the legality of an executive order is analyzed the same way as any other action of, of the president. Um, it's measured against his constitutional authority and it's measured against his statutory authority. Um, because it's an internal direction from a boss to a subordinate, it is not going to be examined um, by courts the same way as they would uh, other exactions, actions of the executive, which have effects outside the, the, the apparatus of the executive branch itself. But it is in principle, perfectly possible to, to judge an executive order by the same kinds of standards and say, look, this is legal or it's, or it's not legal or it's an expansion of presidential power um, that's un, unprecedented or unprincipled um, and so on. Thank you. Um, before I see if there are any other questions, I do want to read the code. The video viewing code for this CLE is 9377. 9377. So let me see if there are any other questions. I'm not seeing any. I'll give that another minute. If you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A. And I'm still not seeing any. Hey, the code hey, is also, I'm sorry? Jill, it's Kevin. Let me, let me ask a question. Um, 
one of one of my concerns as I look at the United States, and and really actually as I've looked at the United States for the past uh, quarter of a century, is that um, we have a population that is uh, decreasingly familiar with the rule of law and the norms of the rule of law, and may very well, at least a sizable portion of that population, may very well not believe in the rule of law. I wonder if you would comment on that. Well. Okay. Um, so I, I, it, it takes me maybe in a slightly different direction than, than, than you're imagining, but, but there's been some really good social science research done since the 1950s, really, about public attitudes of Americans towards freedom and liberty. And sadly, it tends to work out like this. When you ask Americans, are you in favor of, fill in the blank, your favorite liberty, your favorite freedom, they are overwhelmingly in favor of all those things. If you were to ask Americans, I don't know if they've asked specifically about the rule of law, but if you were to ask them, people would say, absolutely, the rule of law, not the rule of men. Um, and then when you probe that with follow-up questions, it turns out that what most Americans mean is that they highly value our freedoms and liberties for themselves, but not so much for other people. So, um, you know, the, the, classics, the classic study of this type was done in the 1950s during the Cold War. And, and it said, you know, do you, uh, how important is freedom of speech? Oh, very important, very important. Okay, um, would you support a communist uh, teaching elementary school? No, zero. So um, there's that kind of dissonance. So when you say that people don't support the rule of law, I think pe people support the rule of law very highly when the law is being applied to them. Um, whether they support it in the application to others, I think is a, a different question. Thank you. There is another question in the Q&A. And the question is, what happens if we don't take steps to revive or rehabilitate the rule of law? What is the next step away from the rule of law? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so when the rule of law starts to erode, uh, what are you left with? You're left with um, other means of fending for yourself. The law is not going to protect you. So if we look at how do people protect themselves in societies in which the rule of law is um, sketchy, well, you know, one thing to do is you, you re it really helps to be rich. Um, so you can bribe people and keep them off your back. Uh, another way is to um, have power. So this is why in societies that are where the rule of law has broken down, uh, people tend to accumulate um, private militias, private security forces. Uh, so, you know, if you think about, um, let's say in Brazil, in a city like Sao Paulo, where um, the rule of law is really uh, kind of... Um, eroded badly, the rich ride around in armored limousines with armed guards and they don't stop at red lights. Um, you need to cultivate friends in high places. Um, you need to have family members looking out for you when they're able to. I mean, it, and human society has been, was like this for, you know, thousands and thousands of thousands of years. That's how, that's how people got along and, and you know, if, if we don't maintain the system that we grew up with, I think that's where we're headed back. Um, I don't see any other questions in the q and I'll give that one more minute. And while I'm waiting for that, I wanna thank you. We are so grateful for your appearance again with the Bar Association. Um, you kind of bookended this here a little bit and <laughs> we really appreciate it your your thoughtful presentations uh, thank so, you it's a pleasure to do it pleasure to be with you thank you so not seeing any more questions in the q a i think at this point then we can say that this program is concluded thank you again thanks everybody